Welcome to The Deep Dive. We're brought to you by HIVRNATestGuide.com. Your trusted source for HIV testing info across the U.S. That's right, with access to, what is it, over 4,500 testing labs? Yep, nationwide. Makes testing accessible. We're uh, really focusing today on the most vital HIV news and updates from the past week, roughly April 28th to May 5th, 2025. This is specifically put together for you if you're looking to, you know, stay right on top of the latest developments in HIV. Exactly. We've sifted through quite a bit of scientific news, global policy stuff, community events. The goal is to give you the key insights, the things that really matter without getting lost in the weeds. Okay, great. So let's, uh, let's start with the science. Some really fascinating medical breakthroughs this week. First up, this research about specific genetic markers linked to long-term HIV remission, even without RT. That sounds huge. It really is. An international team has started identifying, well, specific genetic patterns, you could say. These patterns seem to give certain people a, uh, a natural ability to keep the virus suppressed. You actually suppress it. No? Yeah. And it's not just about understanding why these few individuals can do it. The hope is, can we learn from this? Can mm -hmm. we potentially develop therapies that sort of mimic this natural defense in, you know, a much wider group of people? So like boosting the body's own ability somehow? So precisely. It's a bit of an aha moment, really, understanding how the body can fight back effectively in some cases. Incredible. Makes you wonder about personalized medicine down the line. Okay, and sticking with treatments, what about lenacopavir? This is that investigational long-acting one, twice a year injections. That's the one, Lena Capivir. It's a capsid inhibitor, basically messes with the virus's protective shell. The big aim here is simplification. Imagine managing HIV with just two injections a year. That could massively help with adherence, which is, as you know, so That's critical. less daily burden. Right, and the recent data from Gilead suggests it's uh, pretty effective and generally well tolerated. So yeah, it's a potentially really significant step towards easier long-term care. Makes sense. Okay, and still in the medical realm, but shifting slightly testing. Knowing your status is fundamental, there was news about a new low-cost rapid HIV test from Northwestern University. Yes, and this could be a real game changer for accessibility. It works on something called particle diffusometry. Particle? Mm. How does that work, simply? Uh, well, it basically looks at how tiny particles move around in a sample. It's a clever way to detect the virus or markers of it very quickly. The key things are, accurate results in minutes, low cost, and potential for point of care use right there in the clinic, or even maybe more broadly. That sounds incredibly useful, especially for, you know, communities that might not have easy access to labs or clinics, quick, affordable testing. Exactly. It could revolutionize screening, yeah. potentially catch infections earlier, get people linked to care faster. Big potential impact. Definitely something to watch. Okay, um, let's move on now. It's unfortunately not all positive news. Global policy and funding seem to be facing some uh, challenges. Yes, that's uh, putting it mildly, perhaps. There have been recent policy shifts leading to pretty significant cuts in U.S. foreign aid, mm. specifically funding for PEPFAR, the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief, which has been hugely impactful globally. PEPFAR cuts, that's serious. Where are we seeing the effects? We're already hearing reports from places like um, Tanzania and Eswatini disruptions to essential HIV care services. And health professionals are, quite rightly, sounding the alarm. They're worried about potential increases in deaths, in new infections, if these cuts persist. It really shows how interconnected global health is. What happens with funding in one place? Has ripple effects everywhere. It definitely raises questions about, you know, the stability of global health funding priorities right now. Hmm. And it's not just PEPFAR, is it? I saw something about UNAIDS as well. That's right. UNAIDS, the main UN body coordinating the global HIV response, announced major workforce reductions, cutting more than half their staff, apparently, also due to reduced donor funding. More than half? Wow. What does that mean for their work? Well, it raises serious concerns about their capacity, their ability to do the research, the advocacy, coordinate programs globally. It's bound to be impacted. You're hearing calls from advocates already, urging donors to step up and restore that funding. It highlights how vital these coordinating bodies are. And these funding issues, they have very direct local impacts too, right? Like the situation in Nepal. Yes, that's a really stark example. The withdrawal of some U.S. funding there has apparently led to the closure of critical help centers for the LGBTQ plus community. Oh no. Yeah, these centers were providing vital services, HIV prevention, testing, linking people to care, particularly for vulnerable groups like transgender sex workers. Losing that support network leaves people incredibly vulnerable. 
It just underscores how these high-level funding decisions hit real people on the ground hard. It's sobering, definitely. A reminder of the human cost. <laughs> Okay, let's uh, pivot back towards some more hopeful developments. Clinical trials and the search for a cure. There was news about stem cell transplants again. More potential cures. Yes, reports on two more individuals who might, and I stress might, be cured of HIV following stem cell transplants they received for cancer. So this adds to that small but growing group of people who've achieved long-term remission, maybe a functional cure, through this route. But it's still a very risky procedure, not for everyone. Exactly. Very intensive, high risk, really only an option for people who need the transplant for another life-threatening condition, like certain cancers. But importantly, each case gives us incredibly valuable clues about how we might clear the virus. It fuels hope and, you know, guides research towards safer, more scalable cure strategies. So insights, even if the method isn't widely applicable yet. And what about gene editing? The EBT-101 trial. Right, that's another exciting avenue. This trial uses CRISPR-based gene editing. Think of it like um, molecular scissors to target and actually try to cut HIV out of the body cells. Cut it out. That sounds like science fiction almost. Well, it's becoming science fact. The trial, EBT-101, is apparently nearing completion in 2025. This kind of precision therapy is potentially groundbreaking. If it works, it could maybe lead to a future where people don't need lifelong antiretroviral drugs. A true cure. That's the ultimate goal, isn't it? Amazing potential there. Okay, let's look at some broader public health insights now. There was a finding about gender disparities, men being more likely to die from HIV AIDS. Yes, that data point is quite striking. Men seem to have significantly higher mortality rates from HIV AIDS and also other chronic conditions compared to women. And the experts looking at this suggest it's largely down to differences in, well, healthcare seeking behavior. Meaning men just don't go to the doctor as much. Or they delay seeking care, or maybe aren't as consistent with treatment and follow up those kinds of patterns. So it suggests that addressing these behavioral aspects alongside the medical ones could really improve outcomes for everyone. It makes you think about the you know social factors influencing health. Definitely highlights that it's not just about the virus or the drugs, but also about behavior and access. Um, okay, finally, a community note. The AIDS life cycle ride. It's having its final run this year. Yes, after 20 years, the iconic AIDS life cycle event, that 545 mile bike ride, is holding its final ride. It's quite something. Over its history, it's raised an incredible amount, over $300 million for HIV AIDS research and support services. 300 million, that's huge. It's just immense. So this final ride is really a moment to celebrate that legacy. Not just the money, but the community, the activism, the awareness it's built over two decades. A real testament to long-term community effort. What an impact. Absolutely. A powerful example. So wrapping this up then, we've covered quite a range today. Uh, breakthroughs in genetics, long-acting treatments, rapid testing innovations. But also the serious challenges with global funding, the ongoing search for a cure through things like stem cells and gene editing. And these important public health insights and, you know, moments of community reflection, like the life cycle event. It really shows the HIV landscape is constantly shifting, constantly evolving, staying informed, staying proactive. It's just crucial. Yeah, absolutely crucial. And knowing your status, getting tested, accessing care that remains fundamental. Couldn't agree more. So maybe a final thought to leave you with. Considering these leaps in understanding genetic remission and the potential of things like gene editing, what kind of future do you actually envision for HIV prevention and treatment, say, in the next 10 years? It really does make you wonder, doesn't it?